This week at SpaceX was an exciting week to say the least. We saw new upgrades to Mega Bay, progress on Star Factory. Oh, and this happened. On March 14th, Starship 28, with the help of Booster 10, successfully launched halfway around the world, gracing us with some spectacular onboard imagery and bringing us one step closer to Mars. But before we cover more on this historic test flight, let's look at all that SpaceX did this last week leading up to the big event. Starting off in the early hours of Friday morning, the assembled section of Booster 14's liquid oxygen tank was lifted off of the turntable in Mega Bay 1. Later that morning, components for a new to Starbase lattice boom crane were spotted at the launch site. The truck, however, did not stay long as they turned around and headed back up Highway 4 to deliver the loads at the Massey outpost. Around that same time, we were treated to a very promising sign of launch preparations. Shortly after a visit to the explosives bunker, crews were spotted in lifts at the launch termination system boxes on both Ship 28 and Booster 10. Installation of these systems was one of the final steps towards launch readiness and was a solid indication that SpaceX felt they would launch this week. The crews worked for most of the day installing the explosives that would destroy the vehicles in case of an anomaly. Also on Friday, crews were hard at work on the launch site's new restroom building. New windows have now been installed across the new opening on the wall facing away from the orbital pad. Shortly after midnight on Saturday morning, the chopsticks were raised up to Ship 28's lifting points as SpaceX prepared for the final full stack for the Flight 3 launch vehicles. Early in the afternoon, the Raptor maintenance platform for the orbital launch mount was picked up by an SPMT and brought onto Highway 4. The platform was then relocated to the Sanchez site for storage during the upcoming launch. A short time later, rover camera caught a crane lifting steel up to the top of Mega Bay 2 doorway. Like we saw with Mega Bay 1, this steel will help close in the top of the doorway to protect the mechanisms and the door when it's open. Around that same time, what looks like it could be a new cab for the elevator in the orbital launch tower arrived at the launch site. In the early evening, crews went up in lifts to ship 28's payload bay door. Once there, they removed the remove before flight stabilizer locks from the door, moving the vehicle one step closer to being launch ready. Early on Monday morning, the orbital launch mount work platform was lowered onto its stand and moved away from the orbital pad. It was then rolled across the launch site and onto Highway 4. The platform was then transported to the Sanchez site, where it joined the Raptor maintenance platform to be stored until after the launch. A little later, the PA announced an impending vent from Ship 28 as crews prepared for lifting operations. Then, just before 8 o'clock in the morning, crews removed the temporary pressurization plate from the Starship, one of the final preparations prior to the lift. An hour later, the quick disconnect arm was swung out of the way. Next, the chopsticks once again took to the weight of Ship 28. The ship was then lifted, rotated over, and slowly lowered, aligned, and finally set down on the top of the hot staging ring. With the ship safely stacked on Booster 10 now, its transport stand was rolled away from the launch tower. A short time later, with the orbital launch pad cleared, SpaceX performed one last test of their flame deflector underneath the launch mount. High pressure gas forced the water from the deluge tank farm through the piping to be blasted out of the water-cooled steel plates. Once the test was completed, crews headed back to the tower and up to the quick disconnect arm. There they extended the access platform and prepared the ship to be connected to the tower. Then the quick disconnect was extended and attached to ship 28. Shortly after connecting, SpaceX performed a retraction test of the quick disconnect to verify it was ready for launch. Once the test was completed, the quick disconnect was extended once again and aligned to make its final connection to Ship 28 before the third integrated flight test. First thing Monday morning, the Cameron County Sheriff's closed Highway 4 and the beach to prepare another round of testing at the launch site. The test stand tank farm was spun up and the infrastructure cooled down. 
Then shortly before 9 in the morning, SpaceX began loading propellant into Ship 29. A little over an hour later, the Starship performed an apparently successful sprint prime of all six of its Raptor engines. Meanwhile, up the road at the build site, we continue to see steady progress as crews keep pushing forward with the steel. Other workers are busy installing the windows across the Highway 4 side of the building while cladding is still going in above. Back at the launch site, as testing was wrapping up, we could hear a round of igniter testing. Around that same time, we were also treated to a wave from Booster 10 as SpaceX tested its grid fins, checking off another box on their pre-launch checklist. At the Massey Outpost, the new to Starbase second generation Liebert LR1600 was now assembled and had raised its boom in the air. This large crawler crane is likely on site for the build out of the static fire stand. At Sanchez, just inside the main gate, assembly of the third of the new generation of super heavy transport stands has started. The large steel sections that make up the main structure of the stand are being placed and welded together. Also on Monday, Booster 14's forward dome section was staged in front of Mega Bay 1 as SpaceX prepares to begin stacking operations on this booster's methane tank section. Inside of Mega Bay 2, the elevator floor on the building's middle work stand has been raised up. This allows us a view of the three elevated platforms that have been installed on this stand recently, which will allow workers access to the inside of the ship's engine bay. Up above, much of the steel structure framing for the top of the doorway was now in place with just the Z-girts and the cladding left to install. Back at the launch site, the LR-11000 rolled back over to the test stand as SpaceX prepares to lift Ship 29 back onto its transport stand. Even though the ship has not yet performed a static fire, its test campaign will be suspended until after the launch. Concrete pours for the foundation for the new office building have continued at a steady pace. Crews have been preparing this new facility's substantial footings for several weeks now. It'll be interesting to watch construction and see why such big foundations are necessary. That evening, as workers continue to prepare Ship 29 for its rollback to the build site, the Starship's flaps were closed and secured for transport. Across the launch site at the orbital pad, the scaffolding on top of the launch mount was being removed as preparations for flight pushed forward. By mid-evening, the two-point lifter was moved over to the test stand area where it was picked up by the crane. Crews then set to work attaching the lifting jig to the Starship. Then, early on Tuesday morning, preparations were finally completed and Ship 29 was lifted off of the test stand. Then, the crane swung the vehicle over toward its transport stand and set it down for crews to secure. Later that morning, in the rocket garden, a second grid fin was removed from Booster 4. With Mega Bay full of boosters and an ambitious flight manifest planned, it could be that SpaceX can no longer afford to have this outdated Super Heavy taking up space. At the launch site, crews were seen removing scaffolding from around the liquid oxygen side of the orbital tank farm. It's likely that there is still additional work to do in this area, but SpaceX wants the scaffolding removed to reduce debris during launch. Early in the afternoon, Booster 14's liquid oxygen tank was stacked onto the aft section in Mega Bay 1. This completes the primary stacking operations for this vehicle's lower tank section. Shortly before 2 p.m. local time, Ship 29 had been secured to its transport stand. Crews then went up in lifts and disconnected the vehicle from the two-point lifter, which was then placed onto the awaiting stand by the LR-11000. About a half an hour later, the two-point lifter moved onto Highway 4, followed quickly by Ship 29. The two then took their place in the sheriff-led convoy, heading up the road. Once they arrived at the build site, they were parked near the high bay. Over at the Sanchez site, work was well underway on the assembly of the next section of Starbase's second orbital launch tower. In these pictures, we can see that the crane was placing the third column of what should be the topmost section. At Boca Chica Village, form work was in place for yet another large concrete pour. This large slab is likely being placed for another group of tiny homes as SpaceX continues to expand the local housing options for their employees. Shortly after 1 o'clock on Wednesday morning, the two-point lifter was rolled into High Bay where it was picked up by the building's bridge crane. Once the crane had the lifting jig, the empty stand was moved back out of the bay. 
At the launch site, crews were moving right along with their pre-launch preparations checklist. The transport stands for both Booster 10 and Ship 28 were rolled out of the site and onto Highway 4 to be brought back to the build site for storage during the upcoming flight test. Back at the Sanchez site, the fourth and final column for the top section of the next launch tower was lifted and installed onto the assembly jig as workers continue to prepare for the future. Meanwhile, the LR-11000, having completed all of its pre-launch lifting, laid its boom down across the former parking lot next to the test stand tank farm. This is a normal launch preparation as SpaceX looks to try to protect the expensive piece of equipment as much as possible without going through the hassle of removing it from the launch complex. A little after 10 o'clock local time, Ship 29 was moved into the door of High Bay in preparation for its eventual connection to the bridge crane via the two-point lifting jig. That afternoon, work continued on the next launch tower, with crews now installing the large steel assembly that will stick out past the shorter corner column. This section extends out to the hold of the crown block for the drawworks cable that will be used to raise and lower the chopsticks. As the afternoon wore on, launch preparations entered their final phase. First, we saw a flap test of Ship 28. Around an hour and a half later, Booster 10 followed suit in its own way as it performed test actuations of its four grid fins. That evening, Ship 29 was moved the rest of the way inside of High Bay. Then a few hours later, the Starship was picked up and moved onto the turntable in the back left corner of the building. As the calendar ticked over to March 14th, Highway 4 and Boca Chica Beach were closed for the third integrated flight test of the Starship program. Shortly after 5 a.m. local time, the chopsticks opened away from Ship 28 and moved into the launch ready position. A short time later, venting was seen from the orbital launch mount as SpaceX worked towards conditioning Stage 0 for propellant load. Over the next few hours, SpaceX posted several updates on X, pushing back the launch time due to boats in the exclusion zone offshore. Eventually, however, they posted that they were go for prop load with a T0 target of 8.25 a.m. Just a few minutes later, venting was seen coming out of the purge vent on the orbital launch tower as SpaceX shifted towards final conditioning of the infrastructure. Shortly after 7.30, propellant load began and the excitement kicked up to a whole new level. In short order, frost lines appeared on both vehicles and began to quickly rise as superchilled liquid oxygen and liquid methane rapidly filled the massive tanks on both the Super Heavy Booster and the Starship. Just a few minutes before launch, propellant load was complete and everything appeared to be going perfectly for the countdown. Finally, SpaceX blew right by their final built-in hold point at T-40 seconds and into the final countdown. The detonation suppression system activated, followed quickly by the flame deflector, and Booster 10 lit all 33 of its Raptor engines and left Starbase in the dust. The stack took to the Texas skies, quickly leaning away from the launch tower as we've seen before. The rocket continued through Max-Q and onto the most engine cutoff without a hitch. Then, with Booster 10's three center engines still pushing, Ship 28 lit its engines, the clamps were then released, and Ship 28 sped away as the booster relit its other 10 center engines and flipped to perform its boost back burn. Following its burn, the Super Heavy coasted past the Carmen line to an apogee of 106 kilometers before it started to fall back into the atmosphere toward its destination in the Gulf of Mexico. As the booster dropped below 50 kilometers, the grid fins began their work trying to steer the massive vehicle as it approached the water. As the altitude dropped, the grid fins seemed to struggle to control the vehicle and the landing burn did not go according to plan. Just one of the inner 13 Raptors lit successfully, ruling out a soft touchdown and ending the booster's journey abruptly. Meanwhile, Ship 28's six Raptors continued burning for the full duration, delivering the Starship to its planned trajectory on a course for the Indian Ocean. During its coast phase, SpaceX performed a propellant transfer test, of which we are still waiting to hear the outcome. They also performed a test of the payload bay door that seemed to have some issues, with the door mechanisms looking to bind up just partly open and never seemed to be able to close. 
the planned in space relight of a Raptor was abandoned due to the ship having entered a spin in which it seemed unable to stop. Eventually, the ship's trajectory brought it back down into the atmosphere, although not in the proper entry orientation. We were treated to some unbelievable footage as the ship's incredible speed against the atmosphere created a visible layer of plasma. Then about 50 minutes after launch, SpaceX lost communication with Ship 28, and it is believed to have broken up in the atmosphere, ending a very successful third integrated flight test. Back at Starbase, we were able to start looking around to see how Stage Zero held up to the latest launch. Overall, it seemed that SpaceX has been moving into the correct direction with their upgrades to harden the launch site. There is, however, still room for improvement. About a half an hour later, after the launch, the chopsticks closed and headed back down the tower, indicating that they are still functional. Debris littered the road outside of the launch complex, including several metal sheets that looked to be the armor that was added to protect the insulation on much of the equipment at the tank farm. Several of the cameras left across the street had been toppled, either after being hit with debris or simply being knocked over by the violent shockwave from Booster 10's Raptors. The launch mount and tower themselves seem to have held up fairly well. The booster quick disconnect hood, while still intact, looks to have had some of its paint cooked off by the plume. The chopsticks once again had some cables and conduits hanging down, but as previously mentioned, remained operational. Further up the tower, the ship quick disconnect seems to have fared better than it did the last launch. One of the floor grates on the work platforms, however, seems to have been curled up on itself and will need to be replaced. Over at the orbital tank farm, the cable tray in front of the new horizontal tanks looks like it has seen its better days. I'd say SpaceX will likely have to look into more robust options for this equipment going forward. As the road opened, street sweepers rolled in to clear the road and the photographers came in to recover their gear and start documenting the aftermath. A few hours later, a ship stand and the orbital launch mount work platform were relocated to the launch site. Workers were spotted on top of the vertical tanks at the orbital tank farm, checking for damage. From what we can see, however, the tanks seem to have held up pretty well for a change. As the afternoon continued, the booster quick disconnect was opened and extended to allow access for inspections. A little while later, workers were spotted on top of the launch mount performing initial inspections. Eventually, a couple of workers took a lift up and performed an inspection of the booster quick disconnect for damage. As night fell over Starbase, crews began reinstalling scaffolding on the top of the orbital launch mount to allow workers a safer space to work as they continue their inspections and start on any needed repairs. Switching over to Florida, Just Read the Instructions was towed out of Port Canaveral on Friday morning in support of booster recovery operations for the next Starlink launch. On Sunday, Doug towed a short fall of Gravitas out to sea in support of the Starlink Group 6-44 mission. That evening, Falcon 9 Booster 1077 lit up the Florida skies as it lifted another 23 Starlink satellites on their way to low Earth orbit. A little over an hour later, Booster 1073 was lifted off the dockside stand and transferred to the transporter for its return to Roberts Road. Tuesday at a historical launch complex 39A, it appears that the tops of the legs for the orbital launch mount are being cut off, leaving behind a column of exposed rebar. It's not yet clear if this is demolition or if they are starting to prepare for the installation of the launch mount. That afternoon, Bob was seen arriving back at Port Canaveral after successfully recovering both the fairing halves from the Starlink launch two days earlier. Early the next morning, Just Read the Instructions also came back into port, carrying Booster 1077 following its 11th landing. Several hours later, the Falcon 9 booster was lifted off of the drone ship and placed onto the dockside stand for processing. Wow, what a week! How's that for excitement here at Starbase? Well, that's going to do it for this week's episode, but make sure you tune in next week for more SpaceX and Starbase weekly updates brought to you by Lab Padre. Thanks for watching, everyone. Lab Padre out.